Cassandra Nova wipes out the X-Men, although really she's wiping out 16 million mutants in one fell swoop. It's amazing. So what this does is this opens up 30,000 years ago and Cassandra Nova is here with a guy. Now this guy's name will become apparent. It's really, really cool. He's probably the most important person in the entirety of the story. But what she's showing him here is this idea that whenever you have an advanced group that emerges by whatever manner and whatever means, they will wipe out the less advanced group every single time without fail. That's why she says, this is how it happened last time. Homo sapiens, Neanderthals, the last unlucky remnants of their kind, soon to be replaced by the smarter, faster, more aggressive species, Homo sapiens. Meet our ancestors, wiping out the competition. And this is designed to establish that very fact, that this guy responds and says, no, like I'm sure there's no evidence to show that it went down this way to prove that Neanderthal man was slaughtered. He's like, I saw a documentary on TV. And her response is, so television has made you an expert, has it, right? Like who cares about all the people who have been studying this stuff for their entire life? You saw a documentary once. And so now you know more than they do. And she's like, as the world's foremost evolutionary biologist, Mr. Trask, I can assure you that history is repeating itself as we speak. Now, she does call this guy, Mr. Trask, this is not Bolivar Trask, but we will explain the connection between the two and why he's so important. Now, what we end up doing in the midst of all this, right, while they're talking and while he's really just kind of forced to endure this gruesome nature, what she says is science calls them homo superior, the mutants. You saw my findings. The human race will be just as extinct as Neanderthal man within four generations, unless we fight back before it's too late, unless we exterminate the mutant germline once and for all, humanely, of course. And so what you do is you transition over to the X-Men themselves. Now, this is not an overly important segment to the story overall, but it is cool, right? One of the things to know is this was the advent of Cerebra, which is to say, in the modern era, and even specifically when you look at like the X-Men movies, the ones that came out from Fox back in the day, when you saw the scenes where like Xavier was using Cerebro, the helmet, and he was seeing all these signals of mutants across the world, that started with this, Grant Morrison's new X-Men run, right? That's how that kicked off. But what it does is it's basically just a way in which Xavier can see everything happening. We will transition back to him here in a second, but there is a moment where in South America, in Ecuador, a mutant burst of energy just manifests and then shrinks. Now, Beast is the one who catches it, but it's the fact that this signal had just appeared for a split second and then disappeared again. He's like, something was there. It doesn't seem like it's there anymore, but something was there. And that does happen from time to time in Marvel Comics, specifically when it came to like Matthew Malloy. But this is something that I want you to keep in the back of your head because it will become important. There is a kind of field team of Cyclops and Wolverine and Ugly John, who's not really important to the story. And in fact, he dies a pretty gruesome death, but they're coming back from Australia for a rescue mission, which is actually for Ugly John. And they kind of like deviate these guys and say, go to South America, to Ecuador, and just like investigate this little bit of a signal that we saw. And so what you do is you switch back over to Cassandra Nova and Trask, and you end up finding out that of course, this is all just a virtual reality simulation, which makes sense. There's no real time travel going on here. But she says, imagine the day when the leering freaks and the mutations come kicking down your door to bash your daughter's brains in. Evolution takes no prisoners. And when Trask just starts like puking up, she's like, very poetic, Mr. Trask. Your uncle Bolivar built the first of the old Sentinels. Is that right? The Philadelphia Trask controversial creators of Android weapon systems designed to identify and exterminate mutant X gene carriers. Now, here's something that I want to explain here because the Sentinels themselves, their history is really, 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 really cool. So when Bolivar was introduced way back in the day in the old like Stan Lee, Jack Kirby days of Marvel Comics, those Sentinels were by all standards of measurement, pretty basic. They were just there for the purpose of hunting down mutants and that was effectively it. The Sentinels that you're the most familiar with, specifically the ones that you saw in like X-Men the Animated Series, that's Stephen Lang, no relation to Scott Lang. But the idea is that after Bolivar Trask had been defeated by the X-Men, the federal government was working on Project Wide Awake, which we can go into the history of that at some future point in time if you want to. But in effect, the federal government had taken the Sentinel program by Bolivar Trask 
handed it over to Stephen Lang and said, start developing more and advanced Sentinels. That goes into the Phoenix, Dark Phoenix Luggers, all that kind of stuff. And they've basically been around ever since. This backtracks to the early days of Bolivar Trask, because what she says is she says, they look wonderful, I admit, design classics, but Sentinels have always been spectacularly ineffective against highly adaptive mutant targets. Did you know your tax dollars helped fund a shadow Sentinel program, Mr. Trask? No, you didn't. No one did. And so we end up finding out that the reason why they're here in Ecuador is because a master mold exists out here. Now, for those of you guys who don't know about the nature of master molds, when Sentinels were originally introduced in Marvel Comics, they were just like developed in a factory, but it was a very inefficient way to develop Sentinels because factories are slow and people have to do stuff and robots move around and different things like that. The idea behind master mold is he is a gigantic Sentinel that makes Sentinels. This guy can crank things out like a madman. I mean, even now, like in Marvel Comics, during Fall of X, the master mold that you literally have orbiting the sun, that thing made millions of Sentinels, millions of Sentinels in a matter of months. Days of Future Past, that event happened because of a master mold that was just cranking out a boatload of Sentinels. So that's how effective all this is and how dangerous this is. Now, jumping back to Charles Xavier, right? As he's using Cerebro, he gets this voice that comes out of nowhere and it says, hello again, Charles. The mind amplifier works like a dream, doesn't it? It led me right to where you are. What a special big new toy for a crippled little boy. It's almost like being able to get up and about. You can't form a single thought. And where Xavier tries to talk, this voice says, shut up. It's all garbage in there. So literally this person's powers of telepathy are able to shut down and override the abilities of Professor Xavier. And to show you how significant this is, in Marvel Comics, there is a hierarchy of telepaths. And it does kind of shift depending on how you perceive it. For example, Emma Frost was established to be more powerful than Charles Xavier during Marvel's Civil War event. Jean Grey as the Phoenix is uber powerful. But Xavier's telepathy, depending on the story, can reach across the stars. It can move beyond Earth. That's how he communicated with Lalandra, right? Part of the Shi'ar Empire, his love interest when she was way out there in space on the far side of the universe. But this voice says, I am what's eating your mind. Relax and be replaced. I'll be you now and make you a murderer, Charles, the first, the old, and the last enemy. The hate and the terror that you thought would never return. Charlie's big, ugly secret, the nightmare of the dark side of your dream. Surrender, Charles. And literally, Xavier does the only thing he can do. This guy pulls a weapon out and puts it to his head and says, get out of my head or I'll fire. And that basically forces Cassandra Nova, the one that's been dominating his mind, to retreat. Now, how is Cassandra Nova able to do this? Well, there is a whole origin behind her character, which we can cover at a future point in time if you're interested. But the important thing here is not only does she possess a level of telepathy that is on par with Charles Xavier, she also possesses a kind of latent power or any potential power that Professor Xavier could have by way of his telepathy. She's very much an Omega level mutant, right? Beyond Omega level. She's astronomically powerful. And so where you transition back to Ecuador in South America, Donald Trask is talking to her because that's basically this guy's name. Donald Trask is talking to her. And she's like, oh no, I was, I was miles away, right? She's able to focus back again, right? And he asks like, why am I here? What's the point of me being here? And as they make their way through this area that these sentinels, wild sentinels, end up attacking and that what she tells him is, well, I mean, you only have so much of a hope here, Donald, right? Like go on, meet humankind's last hope against the mutant menace. Talk to them, Mr. Trask, or they'll chop you up and grind you into neatly filed segments. And he says, no, don't hurt me in the name of God. Stop them, stop. And they say, vocal identification, Trask. Prime command protocol search online. Running protocols, stop preserve Trask DNA. And so you get this amazing explanation here because what she says is that must be your famous charm and captivating wit. 
running down into your shoes. And she says, don't be scared. These deformed homemade horrors were manufactured in a master mold designed by dear old Uncle Bali. They'll do anything you say, Mr. Trask. I brought you here in my capacity as a biologist because I feel it's your duty to save the human species. And she says, why be the small man, some dentist out there in Albuquerque, when you could be the scourge and destroyer of monsters? These android assassins have obviously reached the limits of their ability to evolve in this environment. With a word, you can extend their reach. With a word, you can exterminate the entirety of the mutant population in its infancy while the species is still young, too young to fight back. So lower that once commanding voice of yours a few octaves. Forget your dental practice, Mr. Trask. Your future lies in genocide. And so what she does is she kind of explains exactly how all this works. And in fact, you even get this really, really fascinating moral debate between the two, where Donald Trask asks the question, is it evil, Miss Noah, what I've just done, some people would call it evil, wouldn't they? Because what they did is they sent out four of these sentinels into the world for the purpose of attacking the mutant population. We'll see that come to a head here in a minute because it gets wild, right? But what Cassandra Nova says here is, were the doctors who wiped out the entire smallpox species evil? In a world without values or morality, good and evil are just choices on the menu of the mighty, Mr. Trask. When they hear why you launched four supersonic death machines into the most densely populated mutant area on Earth, I think they'll say, by God, he was evil, yes, but evil in a good way. Because what this kind of establishes is like, whether or not we believe that something is bad just depends on how things turned out with regards to the thing that was targeted, right? So if you're an anti-mutant person, then wiping out the entirety of the mutant population, that's not bad, right? I mean, was it an evil thing to kind of kill people? I mean, sure, but it's okay because now we don't have to worry about mutants attacking humanity and overtaking the earth, right? Morality is flexible. There's no absolute out there. I guess maybe some religious perspectives, but for the average person living day in and day out, one day at a time, week by week, month by month, year by year, life by life, that morality is just relative to what we like and don't like at any particular point in time. And so that's the argument that she makes. There is no real hard and fast rule as to whether or not what you're doing is good. And that's why people will say, yes, he's evil, but he was evil in a good way. He did a bad thing, but the end result is okay. Therefore, I'm okay with the action that he committed. And she's like, it's a special feeling, isn't it? Behind the mask of liberal respectability with its safe opinions, we all hate the mutations, don't we? How can it be murder when they're germs or vermin, right? Dehumanizing the nature of mutants themselves. And he kind of asked the question of whether or not it's going to be humane and whether or not they're going to feel pain. And the answer is no, because it happens so fast. Like it's crazy, right? But what she says is over the course of the last three hours, she's basically been copying the nature of his DNA to the point that she can actually make it appear as if she's speaking like him. And in doing so, kills the guy on the spot because that's what she needed him for. Because he was the last of the Trask family, the Sentinels only answer to the vocal statements of Bolivar Trask and anybody with Trask DNA. Now that she can effectively duplicate his DNA, she can appear like him and the Sentinels will listen to her. So there is no more need for him anymore. Now, the other part of this is that Wolverine and Cyclops and Ugly John, of course, end up getting to the island just in time to see the four Sentinels firing off, but they don't fully understand what's going on here. They don't get the full totality of what's happening. And in fact, once they crash land on this island after being attacked by these kind of like little mini Sentinel robot things that they basically emerge and then are effectively overpowered by these sentinels with a quickness i mean so incredibly fast and that's the question that has to be asked what makes these things different well here's the kicker to all of this right historically speaking when it came to developing sentinels there was just a kind of standard method of resource that was imposed on them metals or hard plastics if they were sent after magneto and so on and so forth right but it was like building a car right here's some metal here's some parts you put it together and then you're done the idea behind these wild sentinels is that you would just set up a master mold 
out there in the world somewhere. And what it would do is it would just start scavenging parts on its own. And then it would just build sentinels out of whatever was available. And that's what Cassandra Nova was referring to when she was saying that sentinels were basically limited in terms of their ability to be constructed. But if you put sentinels in a place where they can basically start building themselves out of guns and out of tanks and any kind of vehicles that may exist out there, any planes that are shot down and crash land in their general vicinity, now you have sentinels that could take all kinds of varying forms. When you combine this with the nature of that master mold AI to be highly adaptive, now you not only have sentinels that could take on different forms, you have sentinels that could adapt to the powers of mutants that they're fighting. And that's what makes the wild sentinels so incredibly deadly, but so much more capable than any of the versions that came before them. Because again, Cyclops is taken out, Ugly John is taken out, Wolverine's taken out and all these guys are captured. And so what you do is you pick up with Cassandra Nova as she has all three of them being helped. And because she can duplicate herself to sound like Donald Trask, now all the Sentinels follow her. And so again, like literally Cassandra Nova taunts these guys. She says, the original Sentinels were restricted by their size and shape. These wild Sentinels can adapt and assume any form necessary to engage and destroy the mutant menace menaces like you. And she goes after Ugly John right off the bat. And what she does is she actually injects herself and then she says, Sentinel Man of War, Terminate Piggy, right? That guy, basically Ugly John. And this is where the Grant Morrison new X-Men run completely turned the X-Men on their head historically because Wolverine manages to make his escape. He puts his hand up to Cassandra Nova's head and says, look, like if you make a move or do anything that I don't like, my adamantium claws are gonna come out at 130 miles per hour, so relax. But then Wolverine tells Cyclops, Ugly John is literally just dying, right? This guy's dying in agony. And so Cyclops does the only thing he can do. He says, John, I'm so sorry. I know there's something more than just this world. Deep breath, don't be scared, just look into my eyes. And then he blasts him. It's a mercy killing. He put this guy out of his misery, right? It's, it's nuts, man. You never really saw stuff like this in the old school X-Men comics, even with like Chris Claremont. It's the reason why Grant Morrison's X-Men run was in a lot of ways landmark. In some ways it was trash, but like in a lot of ways it was really, really landmark. And so he tells Cassandra Nova, as X-Men, we're trained to help mutants in trouble. We've also been trained to prevent genetic threats like you from hurting people. And so in the end, they both come to this realization they were basically too late, right? That she starts laughing and it's like, what's so funny, right? Like, where did she send those sentinels? And so what you do is you transition to Genosha where you have Emma Frost who's addressing the class. And this is actually the first appearance in Marvel Comics of Negasonic Teenage Warhead. You guys know her from the Deadpool film, the first film, second film, and then this film. But she literally says, Miss Frost, you think everything's just a joke, but I had the same nightmare 50 times last night and I'm having it right now. Everybody's going to die. And in the midst of all this, the room explodes. And Magneto, who at this point is wheelchair bound and overseeing kind of like the leader of Genosha, he's watching all of this unfold as these wild sentinels descend on to the entire nation and start attacking everybody. And so you have Professor Xavier who's watching all of this unfold, right? Just watching it through telepathy, cerebro, what have you, right? Extermination event underway. Target Genosha. Population 16,521,063 falling, right? Population and then he says, no one saw it coming. They were drinking tea, making love, right? All those lights going out, no one saw it coming. Population, 11,001,467. Population, 8,290,025. 800,000. 763. They're all just being wiped out, systematically eliminated. Cassandra Nova is amazing. With that being said, guys, we're going to bring this video to an end. Let me know what you think down in the comments section and if you want me to finish the rest of this, and I will catch you all later. Peace.